Welcome to the Intentionist Podcast, where we explore the interplay between intuition, spiritual health, and everything in between. I'm your host, Hilary Zwallen. And I'm Amy Schreiber. Our intention is to create a dialogue that inspires you to consciously forge your path with curiosity and compassion for life and its mysteries. Welcome! Today we wrap our series on intuition by diving into all things woo. Cards, palmistry, astrology, energy healing, crystals, and how these arts have evolved through time. Misconceptions and fears around the concepts and why the resurgence in popularity. Because I know you guys have been seeing these all over Instagram and social media. And how it's helping us to tap into the divine feminine. And how some of these tools are... I'm sorry, excuse me, and how you can use some of these tools if they're calling for you. So we're, it's kind of a big topic today. It is, yes. And before we dive in, we just wanted to alert you all to the fact that we have a Facebook group called The Intentionist Circle. And this is meant to be a safe space for you to join the conversation, explore, and connect with other like-minded people. And this will be a private group, so only other fellow intentionists can view the discussion. So if you would like, feel free to join and we hope to see you in there. And as of right now, it's a it's a very exclusive group of me and Amy. So we'd love very to have more, <laughs> more friends join us. So come join us. Um, all right. So shall I go into our quick little quote today? Yes, please do. We had a harder time finding one because we were there was a lot of woo woo quotes that we were like, I feel like we've done that. And I know this is a woo-woo episode anyway. So this is a quick, simple quote from Rumi that is uh, where he says, there is a voice that doesn't use words. Listen. So we thought it was an appropriate quote for our final in, uh, intuition episode. There you go. So to continue with our discussion on tools that you can use to strengthen your intuitive muscles, we thought that it would be important to present um, learning something new as an important way to getting yourself out of your comfort zone and, and exploring um, things that are unfamiliar is a great way to kind of put your senses on high alert and, and learn something. And one of the things that we both found to go along with, with this newness is the intuitive arts, which we were not familiar with before, but which include, like Hillary said, uh, oracle and tarot cards, um, astrology, and all of that fun stuff. Plus, I think it's just having a moment right now. There's like a major resurgence happening where mm -hmm. even a few years ago when you and I were like, what is this? And I, that's this sounds kind of freaky. And then we started to kind of research more and more of it. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, it's exploded into the collective. And I think it's right. something that people are yearning for. And this is all, in my opinion, part of kind of the collective humanity's search for more of this divine feminine. So we're going to talk a little bit about how these divination tools are uh, connected to how we are connecting to our tribal roots as women. <laughs> right. That yeah. makes sense. So no, it does. And I think to like sum it up, I could sum them up in like a quick umbrella statement, which is not going to do any of them justice. But um, just to classify them as simply tools, like these are tools, props and languages that people use as ways to describe intuitive experiences. So this is all all symbolic. And um, any intuitive who, who's practiced in these arts will tell you that they aren't really necessary. Like the tool itself or the language is not what is special or magical or holy. You know, it is, it's attempting to describe that and explore right. that. Right. So let's start with, um, and we wanted to give a brief history of things, but we, this is something that could be like a 10 part series if we really wanted <laughs> right. to dive in. Like as I was researching this, I was like, this is so big. Um, so we're just, we want to really focus on how this applies to the, the moment that's happening now and this mm -hmm. very like feminine 
moment that's happening where people are wanting to tap into this divine female consciousness and kind of how this this plays into that. So do you want to talk a little bit about palm reading? I feel like you know more yeah, about I that can, than I do. Well, I don't know much at all. I have visited two palm readers <laughs> before. Okay. And that is the extent of my knowledge. But um, right. one of them I spoke to, we worked together at an art gallery in Washington, and she told me that she always knew information about people. From the time she was a little girl, she was very intuitive and would get all this information about people. And when she would tell it to them, they would get angry and like they wouldn't listen to her and they would dismiss her. You know, it was like this weird thing. But then she saw she saw a, another woman reading palms at a fair, and this woman was giving information to the person, and the person was actually receiving it. So she was like, "Oh wow, I just I just need a prop if I want to tell people things about themselves." So yeah, so palms were her chosen prop, and she ultimately went on to like study what classically each hand means. And um, in my yoga training we were talking about the hands and like the mudras that you can do and how each finger is a different um, element. So there's lots of things from all sorts of traditions, especially in Eastern medicine, I think, that deals with the meaningfulness of the hands, like the spiritual and the energetic hands too, not just the mm. physical ones. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, palmistry. And also, interestingly enough too, the other... The other palm reader that I went to, she told me, like, yeah, I don't know anything about classic palmistry. I don't know what the lines in your hands mean. I'm just using your hands. I'm just looking at your hands as a focusing point for mm. myself as I think about, like, what I'm going to tell you, you know? I see. And she also told me, she was like, don't go, don't get readings from people. Like, you do your own figuring stuff out. Which I thought oh, really? Was, Did she say yeah. that as like a general rule or just because she she thought you were intuitive? No, I think both. And I think she said she could tell based on things that she said to me that I had a problem like trusting myself and always wanting external validation, validation. and like mm. looking for authority elsewhere. And she's like, no, you need to like do this for yourself. Because that's being told what to do is not going to cut it anymore, right? Well, that's that's interesting that you you bring up that that because that, that as you were talking about palm reading, I was just thinking for anyone. I mean, we know, we all know people who are like super into it and they like mm -hmm. put stock in what anyone else says, and they they a lot of it is just a way to relinquish relinquish responsibility for their own lives and be like, well, sh you tell me what to do. I'll pay you to give me a reading. Right. <laughs> um, but then there's also the aspect of, you know, not taking it too seriously in that it's, of course there's value in it. I mean, the, the idea is that any energetic read, whether it be through palmistry or cards, or if you're going to see a psychic or a medium or is, is a reflection of the energy that you're putting out. Mm -hmm. So, so again, in those situations, your intuition, your own intuitive abilities are always heightened because it's kind of a new thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. What, why don't you give us like a quick overview of cards, which is probably what we're both most familiar with. Right. Okay. So, so I did a bunch of research this week on kind of the history of tarot and and it's it's debatable there is a lot of debatable history around this stuff so mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell you what I found and um and it can just give a general overview but a lot of people think that this that the archetypes that are found in the major arcana of the of the t tarot deck are from that, that they've been around since ancient Egypt and that there were most likely decks of like divination tool type decks that were not obviously the typical tarot that has evolved now into the 72 card deck, I think is what it said that that's like where it is. There's so many different decks and they all so so modern decks, Oracle decks, different tarot decks that have multiple 
different amounts of cards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so everything's changed so much now. But in the beginning, that there were these people believed that there were these tools that were used. But because of all the book burnings over time, that a lot of that has been lost. Mm -hmm. And so in the 1400s, there that was kind of the original there were there were a few different decks that were basically coming out of Italy, and they were morphing into, you know, fortune telling, and they were they were also used for just playing cards, right? Mm -hmm. And it became somewhat of a spectacle, and it's evolved throughout time. But in terms of and, and I mean, I feel like this is something we could do an episode on in the future where we like really go into the details. Yeah. But but they were basically saying that a lot of other Oracle decks appeared around the end of the 18th century and into the early 19th century. And they became really popular after the Napoleonic Wars when everybody was settling down and becoming very bourgeois <laughs> <laughs> bourgeoisie. Right. So it's it's a. Uh, so, it, you know, people had time on their hands, which so when, like when I read diversion. that. Yeah, well, when I read that quote, too, it reminded me of the time that we're going through now, right? Like, mm -hmm. we're going to have this whole episode on self care next week. And we were talking about this. I, mean, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But that a lot of the reasons why we can even go down this whole self care, um, intuitive development it, it path is because we have the luxury of time and privilege that our basic needs are all being met. So we can sit around and, um, right. We're not foraging in the forest like all exactly. day long for our meal. So. Exactly. Right. So, um, so right. So, so there's all kinds of associations and preconceptions with, you know, what's on the actual card and what the actual card means and how the drawing works. But the idea is if you are a reader now, you know, depending on what, what type of reader you are you're, you're going to interpret the cards. There's ways that the cards tell a story when you lay them all down together. There's ways that individual cards have different meanings, but the idea is that they're all symbolic mm -hmm. and it's a way for a reader to look at the cards and see the story play out. And then also it, it, a lot of times it's an affirmation of what the hit was that they were already getting, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Does that I, make sense? Yeah, it does. I think like more, especially for me, like I don't ever try to look at them usually to see like, oh, what's going to happen in the future? If I do this, what's what's going to be this? It's more as like a prompt to get insight around what is currently happening in my life. You know, exactly. it's like, oh, here's a symbol. Let me think about how does this how does this play into what I'm experiencing right now? But um, yeah, I definitely thought that cards especially were really weird at first, like I thought they were weird. I thought they were silly and potentially like dangerous, you know, based on mm -hmm. how I grew up. So to fears um, and misconceptions. Yes. Yeah, let's definitely. Go into that. Um, Cause yes, I think there is a lot of fear around it, especially because of, I mean, there's stuff in scripture about fortune tellers and what is, what is the words? Um, yeah priestcraft is that the word that <laughs> yeah. i've heard used before yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, well, people so. associate it with like uh, satanic worship because there's a devil card and there's a death card it's like it deals i don't want to know when i'm gonna die people think they might find out yeah that they're gonna no. die or things are gonna happen yeah I actually the first deck that I ever got I did a reading <laughs> for one of my friends and I literally picked every single one of like the so-called scary cards it was it was the devil. It was death. It was the tower. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, I was horrified. Like, what do I tell her about these? But it actually ended up making a lot of sense. Like, she had just had a baby, and she was ended up a few months later um, leaving her job that she had planned to stay out after after becoming a mother for the first time. So, yeah, there's nothing more, like, upheaval. And, the, and to... Right. To remember yeah. that the cards aren't really about like the devil is with you and he's tempting no. you. It's, it's the re it's it's an archetype. So it's the symbol of adversity or of addiction or of dealing with a personal vice that could be mm -hmm. anything. It could be any number of things. It could right. be negative self-talk as your personal devil. It could be right in the tower. Like you said, it's a big transitional time. Oh, yeah, and Transitional transfer. The death is like transformation of like 
mm-hmm. the ending of one phase and the beginning of a new one. So yeah, these things, right. like they're all symbolic. It's not scary. It's like when you have a, a dream or like a visual while you're meditating and if it like is mm-hmm. violent or disturbing looking, like it's not like you're taking that literally. You're taking that like a symbol for something else. Mm-hmm. That's the same same type of thing, I think. Absolutely. So I I remember my first deck that I bought was an angel card deck. And that felt really safe to me because it was like all good <laughs> yeah. messages. It was the angels. I was I was totally um used to like that concept of uh, like angels made sense to me because I had been a Christian and so that that I could relate to. I didn't uh-huh. want to see any fairies or mermaids or anything at that point because it was like give me the 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 symbols that I can connect with. Mm-hmm. And I was like there's not a bad card to draw. So I can just <laughs> right. all draw loving messages that are going to help me. So um and that was a great deck for me to just experiment with, right? Was that your first deck too? Was an angel deck or no? I think yeah, you gave it to me. I think oh, that's, that's right. Where, well, actually, the first one you brought, I don't know if it was when you got the Oracle deck or something else, but the first time that I had ever seen a deck and you picked a card, you came over and I was like, this is weird. This is silly in my mind. But I, And you're like, let me pick a card for you. And I was like, OK, I guess. But you picked one card and it was the focus card, which I had been just sitting all morning, like meditating. And my whole little intention that I had picked for myself was focus because I was in the middle of moving and I was like, I got to focus and get stuff done today. So I've just been saying over and over in my right. mind, focus, focus, focus all morning. And then you came over and picked that card. And I was like, Oh, maybe it's something. Yeah, I just here. remember initially being like really emotional when like it was so <laughs> like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is this? Um, so, right. It's an interesting, it, so it's, it's a way to tap into your own, energy field, the uh-huh. energy field of others. And a lot of it comes down to the asking and the intentions that are set by the reader and by the person who is getting the reading. Wouldn't you say that so much of it is about the the space that in which you call in? Uh-huh. Yeah. And the intention. I mean, we haven't really talked about this yet, but we are calling this podcast the intentionist podcast because I think the main thing that we have come to learn was that the intention that you operate with is what's going to determine and affect like everything about your path and your life. And like, it's super important. And this, and with these, these, uh, intuitive arts, it's no, it's no different. Exactly. And that's kind of where it comes down to if, and, and I also think it's, it's dealing get you know if you're going to go get a reading or you're you're dealing with a reader getting an ethical knowing that you're dealing with someone who is not a wounded healer who is not projecting all of their garbage into your into your energy field and someone who is uh there to create that the idea is that it's all it's all you know i think for 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 people who are just dabbling it's like this is all about being um it can be fun and people are like, oh, this is fun and kind of silly. And then I always tell people if ever I'm doing readings mm-hmm. that I'm like, you don't want to do this in a group of people <laughs> unless it's <laughs> unless the intention is to do a group read um, because it's revealing, you know, and it may be very personal. And every time I've ever done one, it's always been like, oh, thank you for bringing me away from the group to do this because I didn't, you know, this is clearly the message that I need to, to get today to, mm-hmm. to kind of bring me down. So yeah. And our, it's, it's a reflection of where we are and it's a, a really interesting way to experiment with kind of dancing with the divine, right? Right. Straight messages back and forth. Right. It's very interesting. It is. Yeah. I think to, Kind of like we come up against these preconceived notions and fears that people have around it. And I think the biggest one that I have experienced towards these type of things is just dismissal, like dismissal as unscientific, as silly or even evil. And I think that like for me, the more experience that I've had in trusting 
and exploring my intuitive communication, the need for that approval and validation kind of disappears, you know, from mm-hmm. the need for, for external. And so, yeah, for right. me, this has been a way to directly confront that because of how it's been perceived. So how do you then, um, how would you use cards yourself? So there's ways that you can go and get a reading from someone, mm-hmm. right? If you're like, I'm curious, I want to go to a psychic, um, or I want to go to a, a reader an intuitive. But if you are just starting out based off of your experience, what would you, what advice would you give? Or how would you direct someone to do that? I would say just to sit down and think about like what you want insight about in your life. Be like, what, I'm going through this problem right now. What kind of insight should I need, do I need to know about it? And then pick a card. You know, that's mm-hmm. one card draw. There's a lot of like elaborate ways to do drawings, which are like the three card spread, the, the cross, the, all these all these different yeah, the 12 months we always like to do the 12 oh, yeah, months spread for each other that's really fun it is at the beginning of the year. so we're and that would that is basically that you draw at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of a 12 month cycle let's say you start in may or something um that you pick a card for every month mm-hmm. of the year and as a theme of guidance of w- what to expect and we did that for each other last year yeah was it last year and it was like every month we'd go through and I'd be like, you're not going to believe what you drew for me in <laughs> yeah. September. It's exactly what I'm going through. It's it's so anyway, it's it's just an interesting way to to kind of to, again, just to dance with the divine. And so where I I wanted to talk about the fear around this stuff and, and you know, take it for what it's worth. I look at it as a personal practice. We all do. If this is something that. I'm assuming anyone that's going to click on the intentionist podcast is open to this sort of thing yeah. because they see our big full moon and whatever. But, um, but if you're dealing with skeptics in your life and it's something that, you know, you're, I know I've been very concerned about how people would perceive me if I was open yes. about this. Um, because I was like, I'm a professional, like I'm a business person, <laughs> I'm educated, I'm this and that. And I, you know, I don't want to be thought of as, um, as, as an outcast or as weird or whatever. And, and what I have found through the process of exploring this and actually being a little more open about it is it's really helped f- for me to be more in touch with my internal feminine power, because yes. really the reasons why a lot of this, I mean, what you're doing is you're taking the power back for yourself. You're, you're learning your own language that you and God have together and you're not deferring to the quote unquote patriarchy, right? Which is kind of what, I mean, the reason why it's all been shouted down and why witches have been burned forever and why, you know, all, all this type of quote unquote magical, uh, rooted, practices have been shunned and poo-pooed and called the devil's work is because it gives people their own personal power and they don't have to defer to something else. Right. Yeah, exactly. For me, using um, cards and also getting to know some of the amazing women that earn their livings as intuitives, what it gave me was Mm -hmm. this new inclusive set of symbols to consider that were female that were animals that was still male but especially coming from this place of dogmatic black and white thinking and uh this male dominated mythology um seeing my initial reaction to these more female symbols i felt this like a certain suspicion and dismissal but it was with this huge amount of longing underneath for like i was just felt so yes. disconnected from like divine feminine energy, especially, um, yeah, with a male God, a male savior that can only be taught to you through male prophets. Like, how are you supposed to actually believe that you can be trusted as a woman and that women are wise and worth listening to? Like, I realized through learning this, that how, how bad, you know, I felt felt about being a woman deep down, you know, under there. Amy, that's so profound. That, yeah, that, thank you for sharing that. I think you said it better than 
anything I've ever heard before. It, you're right. It's it's like, show me the women in the scriptures. There's like three of them, right? Show mm-hmm. me the female heroines in the Western world. We're just getting to a place in history where the conversations around oppression can be had publicly without massive patriarchal defense, mm-hmm. right? So show me the women in certain Christian denominations that can perform rites and ceremonies and not have to defer to a man. You know, women are these natural healers were receptive were in tune all of that i think people that is i think people are like yes that's true they can concede that you know women are intuitive and and we're, we're more that way but throughout history women who have worn the title of healer or sage or priestess have either been written out of history mm-hmm. right because we don't know i mean how many volumes of the bible have there have there been over and over right. and over and over again not to say that there aren't beautiful eternal truths in the book but um you know, either they've been written out of history or they've been named a witch and burned at the stake there. I think I mentioned this in the first episode, but I want to put it in the show notes. There is this documentary. It's a four part series on Netflix that was done by the BBC called the ascent of woman. I feel like any feminist, any woman, even any man should, it should be like required, uh, watching because it just gives you the most incredible historical context of female oppression and this and this yearning mm-hmm. that it and that really we think that we've been oppressed forever and we have in so many ways but there were several different civilizations throughout time that empowered women where women were property owners where they could vote where they were worshiped as deity right. where they were part you know so and it's been written out right so it's it's not there anymore perfect christian example right is mary magdalene right first woman to meet christ out of the tomb some historians speculate that maybe she was his wife Mm -hmm. it would kind of make sense that a spouse would be there mourning the loss of her husband but now she's been depicted in certain areas as a harlot um a priestess who knows who knows right we're we're never gonna know because it's that's a speculative story but right anyway i really yeah i really think that um osho i was just reading his book on um intuition And he said that the heart has been denied. And by the way, it will be useful to remember that the denial of the heart has been the denial of the woman. And unless the heart is accepted, Mm. the woman cannot be accepted. Unless the heart has the same opportunity to grow as the head, the woman cannot have liberation. And so I think, I mean, while it's a little simplistic, and I would say that this can refer to the intuitive feminine aspect, which is in all humans, both men and women, versus like the actual gender of a woman um this idea Mm. definitely struck a chord when I was reading it and it's like it just highlighted how many times I actively try to go against my intuitive heart because it's not what is valued (laughs) you know it's not what I've been taught in society to to value you know it goes Mm. yeah it really yeah even (laughs) yeah it was this week like I didn't realize for a long time how, you know, how deep that narrative went inside of my head. Like the narrative that, you know, you don't, like that is lesser. Your intuitive heart is lesser than your analytical head and, or your intuitive heart as a woman is less than the intuitive heart of a man, (laughs) you know? Right. Well, that's definitely something that I think is, whether intentionally or unintentionally is driven home. Mm -hmm. If you're living in a patriarchal either religion, or if you're in a family where it's just set up where the women aren't as empowered in whatever way that shows up. Right. right? Cause there's so many different ways of it. And I think part of it, I did this, um, I did this leadership training and there was a, one of the coaches there, we were having a difficult discussion about race and identity and equity. And it was this really profound experience. Also incredibly um, uncomfortable to sit in as a white privileged female Mm -hmm. um, who I've always thought of myself as like tolerant and open-minded. And I've always tried to be that, but to kind of sit in and hear the pain of what's really going on in the world. Um, the, the this profound statement was made that was basically like maybe that's what like that's where what you're supposed to do is just sit in the discomfort for a little while like and don't do anything <laughs> you know and just acknowledge that this is where we are and through that you can make the space 
so that things can shift and change. Right. Yeah. You and, can't have any. And that's hopeful. Exactly. Right. And the hope is that we can, that, uh, you know, it sure seems like with, with all going on with the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement and all of this stuff that has been so up for everyone mm-hmm. the last six months with, um, it just being in everyone's face, right? right? There's a lot of and female outrage it, going on right now. Right. As, as it should. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a lot of the shadow that's being made known and we're, we're getting to see kind of the other side of things. You know, this kind of goes back to the future is female, right? Which not so much that, I mean, and, and yes, that, that women will be empowered in the future, but also that this kind of applies to men, right? I was having a conversation with my friend last night and we were saying how, it's also this amazing time where men are being able to embrace more feminine aspects of who they are, that it's just been, it's been so male and it's been, there's been so much of that in our mythology, in our scripture, in our religious and our historical heroines, politics in all of it, politics. Right. Because women haven't even had the chance. Right. Um, but that even through that now that if we're looking at it in terms of balance or yin and yang, Mm -hmm. that even men are being able to tap into more of their divine femininity. And that's going to be helpful too, right? We need both. Exactly. And I think also a a big part of this, um, the biggest indicator of the imbalance that's been going on can be seen just with the earth. Like what have we done to destroy the earth, which is like the ultimate kind of symbol of the divine feminine, you know? for many and so so as part like especially for me personally in my practice getting more in touch with nature and like understanding and giving space for like the anger and disgust at all this destruction that's gone on is has been a way for me to like tap in tap into the divine feminine in myself Absolutely. Spending time away from nature, I mean, in nature, away from technology and modern life. And not to say, I mean, again, I'm a huge fan of progressiveness Mm -hmm. in terms of technology and making advances that can be helpful to to society. The fact that I'm not a big romanticizer of days gone by, because what I think, I mean, we've actually never had as, I mean, poverty's never been less on the planet ever than right now. Right. So not to say that there isn't extreme suffering and that we don't have a long way to go, but, um, but that's, but sometimes it is good to unplug and move away from modern life and go back to the heartbeat of the, of the earth and put your feet, take your shoes off and walk in the sand or walk in the grass and just, and close your eyes and connect to the pulse that's there and the the receptivity and that ground that has been holding us for our whole lives, right? right? Being, Pay attention to that earth energy. Right, being conscious of like the interconnectedness of everything. Okay, so bringing it back to, um, so we've talked cards, we've talked palmistry, we've talked a little bit about the fears around it. Um, since this is our final intuition episode, at least for this series, I'm sure we'll be diving into this as we move along. Mm-hmm. Um, but we wanted to just release something that was all on one topic at the beginning to just see how it, how it comes out. Um, what else do we, is there anything else you want to say, Amy? I think just like making it fun has been an important thing for me to like give myself space to play and imagine and explore. Um, another thing that the, this palm reader that I love in Washington said one time was that, people believe in all sorts of destructive things. Why not experiment believing in really happy, fun things? If you want to believe in fairies, try it. If you want to imagine yourself, like in all these various ways, like the power of imagination and play and laughter is like, can be a really integral Mm -hmm. part of your spirituality. And I think I'm totally against like the tiptoeing around and treating everything as so especially in this realm as like too special or too sacred to like have fun with or to laugh about you know I think I was just reading the Mm -hmm. spiral dance by Starhawk and she said that um 
no one can be whole who is incapable of laughing at him or herself. And I thought that that was, Mm. especially for us, like, I mean, when you realize, when you go from thinking that you know everything to realizing that you don't know anything, it's like, all you can do is kind of laugh, like laugh about how weird you feel, laugh about how, how like baffling everything is. (laughs) So I think just important to remember, like as you're exploring, as you're questioning, as you, maybe if you believe something that you six months later decide is stupid, you know, like laugh, laugh about it. Like, it's not like, this is not serious business. It is, but it's, it's not, you know? Right. Right. I wanted to touch them since we were talking about experimenting and mother earth and divination, I wanted to talk really briefly about crystals Yes, because we've seen a big resurgence. I mean, obviously they're very beautiful to photograph. So I, (laughs) they're great Instagram pictures. So I think there's part of it is that people like to look at beautiful things and crystals are so beautiful Mm -hmm. and they're such an amazing uh, manifestation of the almost like the artwork of the earth, Right. right? I mean, it's taken millions and millions of years of pressure to form whatever kind of rock and sediment that came out of whatever, you know, crystal that you're Mm -hmm. holding. And so, I mean, they've been around, there there was the whole resurgence. I know there was a lot, there've been people into crystals for a long time, but it sure seems like everybody I know now is like, I got crystals and Mm -hmm. I love them, you know? And I felt like kind of a, a, a weird person when I was like going crazy (laughs) buying crystals a few years ago. Um, so I just wanted to briefly talk about using crystals in meditation as a, as a way to help that intuitive development and to know that it can be used in two ways, at least the way I view it. One is you can look at it like these stones hold an actual vibration that helps you to align with whatever you are wanting to align Mm -hmm. to. So if you read like a crystal book and it's like, Oh, rose quartz is so loving. And, um, you know, black tourmaline is so protective or whatever the crystal is that you're into. Um, you can, you know, if you're energetically sensitive, like I, I feel like I, I've got a lot of rose quartz. And when I was first opening up, I was holding a lot of rose quartz because I was like, this is reminding me to love myself. It's mm-hmm. pink. It's there's, there's the ritual part of it. So the first part of it is there's a vibrational energy that you can feel that some people can actually feel that I don't know if it's based in if there's any science anywhere that says yeah. it's, it's true, but from my own little metaphysical experience and from the experience of many others, that there is a, a vibrational energy there. Now, if you're saying that's all garbage, I don't believe in any of that. Then I always say to, if you to use the crystal as a reminder of earth energy, that oftentimes we're living in cities or we're living in apartment mm-hmm. buildings, or we're, we're not able to go access nature like we would maybe like to, and to just have a crystal that you can hold to remind you of the earth, right. that if, it, if there's a color that it represents to remind you to love yourself more, or to remind you to set up your mental and energetic boundaries. If you're going into situations where you're dealing with people who are harmful to you, um, that that's kind of a a really quick way to align with crystals or use crystal energy. And I just think they're great. They're wonderful to hold when you're trying to meditate. They're just, I think you summed it up really good for me. I am not as prone to use crystals very often. I love crystals. I have a bunch and I love to look at them and I love to touch them. But my relationship to them is like very, I'm very divided on that. It can kind of be summed up by like, I I was on Instagram and I saw someone had done this beautiful crystal grid and it was um, like the affirmation in the middle of it said, I am prosperous. But when I saw it, I thought it said, I am preposterous. And I, (laughs) and that's kind of, (laughs) that's kind of how I feel when I, when I tried, like, I've tried to think about them, like Mm. assigning them actual beings, like think of them as little beings, but I feel Mm -hmm. kind of silly when I do that. But I do, I do enjoy, like you said, um, using them as a focusing point for like a symbol either of, oh, this is my symbol to remind me to think about my higher self, or this is my symbol to remind me to think about the earth. But 
Yeah, crystals right. are beautiful. And or I'm, I'm taking this crystal and I'm dedicating it to this person who's going through a really rough right. time. And every time I see that crystal, it's going to remind me to say a prayer on their behalf or to send them loving energy in my mind or right. whatever. It's about the intention. Know. So they're great relics. So do you want to talk really quick about books because we're almost yeah, out of time? Let's, um, I think we mentioned in our first episode, we talked about Women Who Run With the Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. And this is my favorite book about how to kind of view intuition as a woman in a new framework that I wasn't familiar with before. And she uses so much myth, too, that it's she really gives you the context of 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 um, moving as a woman. Yeah, she's like psychoanalyzing all these fairy tales. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, so I, lo- I loved that one for what it the insights it gave me as a woman, I loved it. Um, another one I just mm-hmm. read was the Osho book on intuition. And he has like some interesting stuff. I don't know if I all the way agree with everything he said in there, but I like his distinction that he says between instinct, intellect, and intuition. I think it's a really simple and really clear mm. way to kind of approach it. And then a few other ones, like... You can try Sonia Choquette's Trust Your Vibes, Shakti Gawain's Developing Intuition, or Caroline Mice Smith's My Sacred Contracts. Ma- it's Mace, Mace, Caroline Mace, but it's spelled M-Y-S-S. Yeah, Sacred Contracts. She also does Energetic Anatomy and all of that, too. And there's another one called by Dr. Mona Lisa Schultz, who uh, wrote Awakening Intuition. That's also a really good awesome. one. Awesome. Yes, and um, that does it for this series on intuition. I hope that you join us for our next series on, um, we're going to be talking all about healing and self-care and how to be your own healer, basically. What are the aspects of that? And um, are we all trying to go a little overboard with that or is it not enough at this point? So we hope you join us. Before we part, we'd like to say thanks for listening, and we hope you'll connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We would love to hear from you and appreciate all feedback, shares, and likes. To learn more and subscribe to our newsletter, visit intentionists.com. And no matter where you are or what you're creating, we send you love and invite you to breathe and begin. See you next week.